Hello AP Calculus BC students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School and I want to welcome you to our introductory video over our unit that we call 6-7-8 BC which is our funny way of saying all of the BC topics that occur in units 6, 7, and 8 from the AP Calculus CED issued by the College Board. This predominantly is going to cover topic number 6.13 and I'm going to have a series of videos that will talk about the idea of the improper integral and that's what 6.113 is all about. And it's likely if you're watching this video you know a little bit about what an integral is but what about this word improper? So let's kind of give you an idea about what we're looking at and I'm going to do that by sharing a graph with you. As usual, I'm going to use my trusty TI Inspire CX Premium software to demonstrate this. And I'd like to use a function that might be a little familiar to you, f of x equal 1 over x squared. Sometimes we jokingly refer to this as the volcano graph at my school because it has that sort of volcanic, volcano shape to it, so to speak. And I want to talk about finding the area uh, bounded by this curve, which is a very suitable application of integration, right? We all know that. So what if I think about doing this a couple of different ways? Let's say I go into the calculator and I say, hey, calculator, I want you to analyze this graph and actually integrate this graph. And let's start at, say, a lower boundary of 1. And as I slide this over, you can see that it's going to allow me to continue to move on with my upper boundary and it's actually computing this area for me and you can sort of see that in gray and as I continue to move this to the right I'm picking up more and more and more area I'm accumulating more area now my graph only goes up to as far as 10 but I could certainly extend this farther if I wanted to but the question that I have for you is at what point can I stop in other words, what if I do want to go on forever? What if I want my upper boundary of integration to be positive infinity? Is that a possibility? And then if I do that, does that automatically mean that the area is infinite? Or am I accumulating so much small space that I could conceivably have an answer? And that's the question or one of the questions that we're going to try to address with the idea of the improper integral. Now another way to think about this is what if, let's say, I want to find the integral and let's say I want to start, oh I'll go here at say negative 4 and if I accumulate the area moving to the right that causes me to run through that vertical asymptote. Well what does that say? about my area. And you can see that I've got this scientific notation value, but how do we interpret that? What does that mean? How much area did I really accumulate considering the fact that this volcanic shaped graph is going to basically continue to account for very infinite amounts of area? Can I still add those together? Or maybe it is infinity. So these are the types of questions that are going to be addressed through not only this, this video, but a few of the videos that we're going to continue to, to take a look at. So let's return to the notes and see what we've got. So here we are with the front page of our notes for what I call Unit 678 BC, the miscellaneous topics from those three units in the CED that pertain only to Calculus BC. And so topic 6.13, entitled Evaluating Improper Integrals, is going to start by mentioning a few things about our good friend, the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. If you remember, a definite integration problem, the one that looks kind of like what I've got here in my notes, the integration of f of x from a to b, requires that that particular interval, a to b, to to allow our function to be very well behaved and we need this to be finite. We need this to have some kind of a numeric answer. Furthermore, that fundamental theorem of calculus stipulates that this function that we graph must be continuous on the interval a to b. 
Well, in this particular topic, we're going to encounter some procedures that will help us evaluate integrals where both of those may not necessarily be true. In other words, maybe one or possibly both of the boundaries of integration could be infinity or negative infinity, or possibly f has this potential finite number of infinite discontinuities. Now I know that that seems really confusing. What does that mean, an infinite discontinuity? Well, if you think back to the graph that we just looked at, the 1 over x squared, we have an infinite discontinuity there at the y-axis because the graph is certainly discontinuous because the limit approaches infinity. And in the green box, I just wanted to kind of redefine what that infinite discontinuity means. Basically, it's the definition of a vertical asymptote. Think of an infinite discontinuity as like a vertical asymptote. Integrals that possess either of those properties are called improper integrals, and they have to be handled a little bit differently than your normal definite integrals that you've studied before. So as you can see here, to get a better idea of how to evaluate an improper integral, let's consider the following problem that we just discussed, that integration of 1 over x squared with respect to x. Well, notice that I could integrate that, say, from 1 to some undisclosed upper boundary that maybe I'll call b. And I can go about my business of integrating it normally, plug in my b and plug in my 1 and subtract. But if I really want that b to go towards infinity, I have no choice but to rename this b as an infinity. Well, that's a problem because you really can't put an infinity as a boundary on an integral because it violates what the fundamental theorem of calculus is trying to say. So we can outsmart the problem, and we will, we will outsmart the problem by using that b boundary, but letting the b approach infinity by using our good friend from calculus ab, the limit statement. And once you put those two ideas together, you're going to be able to evaluate any type of improper integral. Sometimes they'll have answers, which means they converge, but sometimes they don't have answers, which means they're going to diverge. So that's what we get to look forward to. So an improper integral can be interpreted as the area of unbounded region between a graph of f of x equal 1 over x squared and the x-axis moving to the right of x equal 1. We can actually find that particular area even though it's unbounded. So on the next page here, I have my uh, proverbial blue box <laughs> that does give the definition of improper integration that do have these infinite integration limits. And there's really three different forms. You're going to look for some problems that have an upper boundary of infinity you might see problems that have a lower boundary of negative infinity. Each of those would be coupled with some finite lower limit or upper limit. Or probably the most egregious of all infinite integration limit problems, the ones where you have both negative infinity and positive infinity as your boundaries. And we're going to take a look at those in some future examples. This particular table will break down how we set each of those problems up. Okay. Now, one thing to point out before we actually do our first example. It says, in the first two cases, the improper integral converges if this limit that we set up indeed exists. Otherwise, the improper integral will diverge. That means it doesn't have an answer. That means it's going to produce infinity as a result, or maybe even negative infinity. Now in the third case, since we have two separate integrals that we break this into, what happens is that the overall improper integral on the left side of the equals will end up diverging if either one of these has a divergent answer. So sometimes you might get lucky, and if the first integral here on the right side diverges, you don't even have to evaluate the second one. Because if you take infinity and try to add it to something, you're still going to be stuck with infinity. I think a lot of these uh, setups are going to be much more clear as you continue to practice these problems. Maybe watch more of my videos and see how each of these types 
interact just a little differently. So let's go ahead and take a look at our first example. In this particular problem, we're going to take the uh, improper integral of 1 over x with respect to x from 1 to infinity. Now, know this, this is a slightly different graph from the one that I showed you a moment ago. So, one of the things that is paramount, very important that you do with these problems, you cannot proceed as long as infinity is a boundary. We're going to look for a setup that will give you sort of the license to solve this using the fundamental theorem of calculus. And you're going to be awarded a point for that, whether it's on the AP exam or my assessments that I give at my school. So what that means here is that we're going to let a limit take hold. And it really doesn't matter what variable you use. I will say that one of my preferences is to use B as an upper boundary. If you're replacing infinity as an upper boundary, I would typically use A if I'm replacing negative infinity from the lower boundary. So we'll let the B approach 0, and we're going to integrate from 1 to B now of 1 over x, and I'll put my dx outside there. Okay. Now I've given ourselves the green light to use the fundamental theorem of calculus because I'm not committing myself to B being infinity. Who knows what B is? Maybe it's 100, maybe it's 1,000, maybe it's 10,000, but it can be construed as a finite value now. So the limit statement is going to be patient and dropped right in. And then when I integrate 1 over x, we of course will get the natural log of the absolute value of x. And our boundaries would go from b down to 1. OK, now what comes next? Well, we uh, continue with our fundamental theorem, which means we're going to plug in our b, and we're going to plug in our 1. And if we subtract those, we get the natural log of, I can still put the absolute values around the b. Maybe I should. And I'll subtract the natural log, but I'm not going to put absolute values around the 1. B was a little different. It's a variable. However, we probably feel confident with the fact that this is eventually going to be positive if, if B is approaching infinity. So we're going to take that into consideration. And we're basically going to see what happens if B is infinity. Well, what this is going to produce is essentially the natural log of infinity minus, well, the natural log of 1 is 0. So then we have to start thinking, what is the natural log of infinity? Well, if you have a little bit of recollection about the graph of natural log, and it's a graph that really every calculus student should know, it looks a little something like this, if you remember. It starts down there in the quadrant 4, and then kind of moves up into quadrant 1, passing the point 1, 0 along the way, crossing through it. And, but we can see that as x gets larger and larger and larger, the y is also going to get larger. Not quite as fast, but it's definitely going to get larger. So we can say that this kind of approaches infinity. And that's all you need to know. Because if infinity is indeed the answer to your limit, that means that this area is too big to count, and therefore, we're going to say that this diverges. And you want to make sure that you use that word to sort of put the punctuation on the answer. Now, I'll try to return to the graph here and give you a little bit of graphical insight into what example one is all about. So one more time, we return to our calculator. And you'll notice this time I've gone ahead and sketched the graph of the function 1 over x. Now, what we're trying to address is, what is it that we're going to get if we find the integral starting at 1 and move towards infinity. Well, as you can see, the area under the curve between the x-axis is just growing and growing and growing. Maybe not quite as fast as I get closer to my right side, which is around 18. But if I were to continue going on forever and ever, we are going to continue to pick up area. According to this problem, the area that we pick up is significant enough to continue to add and give us an infinite amount of area. However, if you return back 
to that previous problem that we talked about, 1 over x squared, it's a very different story altogether. And that's what makes this very interesting. Just because we have an infinite amount of space doesn't mean that we can't add it up. Sometimes we can add up an infinite amount of space and get a finite numerical answer. But in the case of this problem, that wasn't working for us. Now another kind of cool thing to, to think about is if you use a CAS type of engine on a, on a calculator, you can perform improper integration and the calculator for the most part will understand it. The TI Inspire does a pretty good job. And if we use infinity as an upper boundary, which is a little unusual, what does the calculator say about one over X's integration, the area under the curve one over X from one to infinity? Well, it says infinity. So the calculator know that it diverges as well. So anyhow, I hope that this gets kind of the, the, the juices flowing and you start to kind of think about some of these ramifications that are associated with improper integrals. We have several videos left to kind of gradually maybe raise the bar a little bit and look at some of the more interesting aspects to improper integrals. Thanks for joining and we hope to see you at the next video.